purely an issue of justice. This is a giant industry causing untold and difficult to count levels of suffering. So for me, this is doing what my parents taught me to do, which is do the right thing and speak truth to power. Now, I like to throw up this picture. Just I found it on the web about four weeks ago. And um, that woman on the left-hand side of the sign, that's Maya Angelou. And that guy on the your left, that's me. It was one of the highlights of my graduate school career. I got to sit in and get arrested and lead the singing with Maya Angelou as we were trying to get the UC system to divest uh, from investments in South Africa. So anyway, that's me. I like to start with a little bit of this because we hear so much about what a divided country we are, but at the values level, we really aren't. I think we agree on the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And as part of that, equal access to the opportunity to be healthy throughout the course of our lives and the need to protect vulnerable groups, including young people, people in recovery, and so on, from being deprived of those rights. So these common concerns are the basis for our common efforts. All right, alcohol. It is our favorite drug. It kills nearly 500 people a day in the U.S., uh, nearly 20,000 people a year here in California. Uh, the number one drug among young people and adults related to more than 200 disease and injury conditions in the human body, including seven cancers. And it's a major cause of social inequalities. The same amount of alcohol will cause much more harm in a poor family, poor community, or poor country than it will in a wealthier setting. According to one study, it was a meta-analysis some colleagues of mine did, alcohol use accounts for more than a quarter of the social inequalities in mortality across the board. That's how big a deal it is. That's kind of why I've spent 37 years of my life working on this. You're here partly because of underage drinking, and the dirty little secret about underage drinking is kids like drink like the adults drink. And this is just a study showing that across the 50 states. What are the things at the adult level that tend to influence young people's drinking? Parental alcohol use disorder and family disruption. Parental approval or disapproval of substance use. But critically, the alcohol and policy environments that kids are growing up in. And again, we have that this across the 60 states. I have colleagues who have ranked the states. They've scored them based on all the policies that they've got in place about alcohol. What they found is a 10% increase in that score is associated with an 8% reduction in the odds of young people drinking and a 7% reduction in the odds of youth binge drinking. So not only do adults influence young people's drinking, but what we adults do around policy hugely influences young people's drinking. That's not the popular belief. The popular belief is we should just educate, educate. The problem with that with young people is human brains develop asynchronously. And in the human brain, first of all, it's not mature until probably age 25. The part of it that is associated with immediate reward, emotion, emotions, processing, peer information, that's the limbic system that develops first. The part that is about uh, long-term thinking, planning, uh, sort of the executive functions of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, that develops later. So this is your limbic system. This is your prefrontal cortex. And this is your limbic system developing before your prefrontal cortex. Where have we come from? in terms of alcohol and alcohol policy. It's been a long history since the repeal of Prohibition. We're now a hundred, almost uh, 100 years into that. Right after repeal, people were very clear still that alcohol is a major social uh, and economic problem for our country. So they put in place a system that was based on three key pillars, high taxes, limits on how much the industry could advertise and 
and then limits on how it could be made available and how much the industry could integrate itself, how much they could become concentrated over time, because a lot of what prohibition was about was about pushing back against the political power of the alcohol industry. What replaced the prohibition paradigm, if you will, uh, post-prohibition, you got the rise of the alcoholism paradigm. And on the one hand, this is a very important thing because it's helpful to understand this as a disease, as addiction, etc. That's been critical for pushing back against stigma uh, and all that. But that paradigm has also worked really well for the alcohol industry. They've argued that alcohol problems are entirely the fault of the addicted, the small minority of the drinkers who abuse their product, and that all we need to do is identify them and treat them, and all the problems will go away. Would that that were the case? What we replaced that with, we learned from that experience, the problems weren't going away. So what we moved on to in the 1980s and San Diego was the uh, the cradle in a certain way of this whole approach was applying the larger public health model to this. And the public health model for any disease or injury condition that affects a human is basically there's an agent, the human. I'm sorry, there's an agent, the host. I'm <laughs> there's a host, the human. I teach this. <laughs> there's an agent, which is that which causes harm. And there's an environment which enables the agent and the host to interact in a ha harmful way. And what we realized is in that alcoholism paradigm, we weren't paying any attention to the environment. And there was a whole lot we could do in that environment to reduce the odds that alcohol would interact with humans in a harmful way. Across public health, Tom Frieden, when he was the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, published this in the American Journal of Public Health. It's called the Health Impact Pyramid. And the point he was trying to make is these are the factors that influence health. And most of what we do in public health is up at the top. Counseling and education, clinical interventions, maybe a few long-lasting protective interventions, but the biggest impact comes the lower you go in the pyramid. If you can influence the context in which people are making their decisions about health, and even more, if you can influence those big socioeconomic factors, which have so much to do with what I would call people's health chances through life, that's where we get the biggest bang for the buck. So this is that paradigm, that model, applied to alcohol. You can see we've got alcohol education and counseling and screening and brief intervention with referral to treatment. Important, but going to have the smallest impact at the population level. Uh, Evidence-based treatment and other in medical interventions. Important, but not nearly as much impact at a population level than in the first place, making sure there's population-level access to treatment and SBIRD, and what are called strong media campaigns. Now, strong media campaigns, the federal anti-drug media campaign at its height was being funded at $140 million a year, and one of the evaluations concluded that wasn't enough money. So a strong media campaign has to have enough behind it to break through the media clutter. The big bang for the buck and where I've spent pretty much my entire career is at this fourth level. Removing dangerous products. So you all are familiar with Four loco. We don't have caffeine, guarana, ginseng, taurine, et cetera, added to Four loco type products anymore. And we don't have that because people like the people in this room advocated to the federal government, advocated to state attorneys general, and you're not allowed to add stimulants to a malt-based beverage in the U.S. anymore. Still can get it in Canada. Uh, increasing alcohol excise taxes, reducing the number of outlets, reducing social hosting, restricting and reducing alcohol marketing. Those are the things that will give us the biggest buck in addition to the big social justice interventions like reducing poverty, increasing education and employment opportunities across the board, and improving human rights. And I'll come back to this later. 
So, San Diego, you all were first. When I got into this field in 1986, we were learning from you. We were coming down here to be trained by the people who were pioneering all this stuff in San Diego. And it was wonderful. They grounded it in two key things. First, in data collection. So this is the place where people first got place of last drink data from drinking drivers. Data on where the kids were actually getting the alcohol. So we knew where to intervene. Uh, early work on regulation of public drinking in places like beaches, parks, etc., and then a laboratory for city-level policies like planning and zoning, tools that cities could use to make a difference since the state has all the power over the licenses. This is a way that cities, communities could have a voice in this. And the beauty of the San Diego approach was putting that community voice at the center of all of this. It was listening to the communities and putting tools in the hands of communities to make their voices matter. There is a really important equity story to be told about alcohol. In the U.S., this is what we call the alcohol harm paradox. In general, lower income indigenous people and people of color are less likely to drink than white people, but suffer much higher levels of harm. I made this point before, same amount of alcohol in a four family community or country will cause far more damage than a health wealthier setting and the 27%. Well, who drinks in this country? It's all here on the slide. It's mostly white people. It's mostly upper income white people, okay? Two and a half percent of the drinkers consume a quarter of the alcohol, 5%, 40% of the alcohol, 20%, 88% of the alcohol. Who are those people? They are mostly white and higher income, and they also happen to be the people who write the laws, which is part of why we hit so much, so many barriers when we try to change alcohol policies. This is their favorite drug. So whom do we really need to educate? That's the California State Assembly. What do they need to know? Alcohol is not an ordinary commodity. This is not laundry soap. This is not breakfast cereal. This trade requires regulation, and we know how to reduce and prevent alcohol-related harm. What we lack is the political will to do that. So, again, the bigger picture, why regulate? This is WHO worldwide, somewhere around 3 million deaths a year caused by alcohol. Here in the U.S., six leading actual cause of death, 178,000 deaths a year, one in eight deaths of people of working age caused by alcohol use. Since the turn of this century, things have been getting worse. We did so much work across California in the 80s and 90s. It was incredible. I mean, we mainstreamed the whole environmental approach, and so much happened. And the field turns over, and people forget, and the alcohol industry is always there, pushing, pushing, pushing. That's their job. We have to remember our job is to push back. So... First, roughly the decade of our of this century, alcohol use in the last months, 12 months, grew by 11%. High risk drinking up by 30%. DMS, DSM-4 alcohol use disorders up by close to 50%, with the increases greatest among women, older adults, racial and ethnic min minorities. Some days I can spell, and uh, individuals with lower educational le levels and family incomes. So this is just a graph of that. These are the federal figures, and you can see there's alcohol consumption just going right up. And guess what? The problems were going up at the same time. The alcohol-specific death rate from the conditions that are 100% caused by alcohol, up 35%. ER visits per 100,000 population involving alcohol, up 47%. And the canary in the coal mine, age-adjusted death rate for alcoholic liver disease, up by 47%. We should be noticing. We should be listening. Something's happening here. And it got worse during the pandemic. Deaths up by a quarter. The age-adjusted death rate from alcohol up by a quarter. The largest increase among 35 to 44-year-olds. 
So what works? The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has a group called the Task Force on Community Preventive Services, and it looks across all of public health. It does the big evidence reviews to tell CDC, this is what the research says works. So for alcohol, this is what the research says work. Increase alcohol taxes. Regulate the density of alcohol outlets, and I'll get to that. Make commercial hosts liable. Avoid privatization of alcohol sales. Too late for that in California. Maintain limits on days and hours of sale and enhance the enforcement of laws prohibiting alcohol sales to minors. Now, I do a tremendous amount of work with the World Health Organization, and partly it's because even though we're thin on the ground in terms of alcohol policy expertise in the U.S., we're even thinner when you spread us across the world. And this is a huge global problem. So WHO has its own unit that looks at effectiveness and cost effectiveness and identifies what they call the best buys, the most effective and cost effective best return on investment strategies. And for them, they are three things. Increase alcohol taxes, limit where and when and to whom alcohol can be sold, and ban alcohol marketing and sponsorship. So I like to summarize those as the three A's. And this has been the story of my career. To prevent and reduce alcohol use and related problems for young people and adults, we need to make alcohol less affordable, less available, and less attractive. And I'm going to break down each of these. So let's talk about affordability. I like to start with Adam Smith, the godfather of capitalism. Sugar, rum, and tobacco are commodities which are nowhere necessaries of life, but which are become objects of almost universal consumption and which are therefore extremely proper subjects of taxation. Thank you, Mr. Smith. <laughs> what do we know about alcohol taxes and health? In this sense, alcohol is an ordinary commodity in that increases in prices, which usually come through raising the tax, are associated with reduced demand for alcohol. And this is true among young people. It's true among heavy drinkers. This is one of the easiest things for us to study because it's all about numbers. So we have literally hundreds of studies that have made thousands of estimates of this relationship. We also have many studies that have looked at after the prices go up, what happens turns out binge drinking goes down, drinking driving goes down, violence and crimes, risky sexual behaviors, sexually transmitted infections, and liver cirrhosis mortality all go down. It's an amazing intervention. And this is what's happened to our federal alcohol taxes. This only goes through 2014. We then had an alcohol tax cut in 2017, and I'll talk about that in a minute. This is what's happened to state excise taxes on alcohol. Fallen, 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 fallen. Why is this happening? Because almost all alcohol taxes are a flat tax. They're based on how much beer is in that can. And how much beer is in that can has not changed in the last 50 years. But the value of the dollar has. So every year there's inflation, which is almost every year, this industry gets a tax cut. The result? The price is wrong. Off-premise, and I've done this over and over again, I used to do this in Baltimore, send a student, a research assistant, whatever, to one of our corner stores and come back with what's the cheapest form of liquid you could find. And over and over again, it was not the orange juice, not the milk, not the soda, not the water. It was the beer. This was not the case when I was a kid, because when I was a kid, that tax had not been eaten away by inflation. On-premise, alcohol widely discounted. So I made this point that 2017 tax cut <clears throat> included a federal tax cut worth an estimated, and I just checked this figure, I thought I'd changed it, but actually I found it's worth about $2.1 billion a year for the alcohol industry. And the Treasury Department released a study a year and a half ago. This tax cut was sold as for the craft brewers, for the little guys. It's going to help them. Two-thirds of the benefit from that tax cut went to the largest producers. It was not a little guy tax cut. Do the taxes work? This is a campaign I was intimately involved with, so deeply involved I lost sleep over it. 
Um, but in Maryland in 2010, we increased the sales tax on alcohol by 3%. And if you go to Maryland, I'm very proud. And you buy alcohol either on or off premise, your receipt will have a little line on it. Alcohol tax 3%. That's my line. <laughs> Originally, this is where the money went. That was our coalition. That's part of how you make this work. You sell off the proceeds to groups that have a combination of a need and political power. That's how you make it work. And because it's a sales tax, it does rise with inflation. It's currently worth more than $100 million, still going to all those good things. And what are the health effects? An immediate 3.5% drop in alcohol consumption compared to what it would have been otherwise. And from 2011 to 2016, looking over five years, an 11% drop. A 6% drop in alcohol-positive drivers on the Maryland roadways. And a 17% drop in binge drinking, and a 26% drop in the number of students who drank in the last 30 days, 28% drop in youth binge drinking, etc. All sorts of good things. One of the big pushbacks on these, the industry says, oh, they're so regressive, they'll hurt poor people the most. Well, we have the calculator. It's up on our website. Wealthier people will pay more than poor people. This is a nickel a drink. It's what we tried to get in California with a ballot initiative in 91. The industry spent $40 million at that time to defeat that ballot initiative. I like to say we diverted $40 million from their advertising budgets. Mm -hmm. That was the win. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but anyway, not nearly as regressive. And, I mean, this is excessive drinkers. And I would argue that these things are progressive because rich people drink more than poor people. So they will pay more of the tax. And the tax increases are targeted. The people who drink the most will pay the most tax. And that's exactly who we want to be affected the most. For lower income people, they are a win-win in that the taxes fund government services, which lower income people are more likely to use and need than higher income people. And they will influence a lower income individual drinkers drinking more because the family budget is smaller, they'll feel it more. The effects are progressive, and our current low alcohol taxes benefit wealthy people more than lower income people in that they are paying less for a product that is causing literally hundreds of, billion, of millions of dollars of damage every year and not paying for itself. All right, that's affordability, availability. This is the basic message. The more outlets you have, the more violence you get. What's alcohol outlet density? It's the number of physical locations where you can purchase alcohol, either per area or per population, and outlets, any commercial outlet that sells or serves alcohol. This includes off-premise and includes on-premise. What's the science here? Again, the CDC body concluded Limiting alcohol outlet density is a good thing to do to reduce excessive drinking through the use of either licensing or zoning processes. So many studies, when the number of outlets goes up, I mentioned violence and crime, but also sexually transmitted infections go up. Noise, injuries, property damage. We have studies in city after city after city. This is a large and robust literature. And underage drinking goes up. Um, whether you're looking at, this is a 50 California cities uh, study. Uh, this is another one, a zip code study across all of California. Another study from Oregon. We have other studies in New Zealand, Switzerland, et cetera. Lots of studies all finding the same thing. The more outlets, the more drinking, the more problems. In terms of underage drinking, a 10% increase in alcohol outlet density was associated with a 17% increase in the odds of adolescent alcohol consumption, according to one study. And children with an alcohol outlet on their, on their walk, that they have to walk past on their way to school, twice as likely to report feeling unsafe in their neighborhood. What happens that crowding leads to violence? We did this study in Baltimore, actually colleagues of mine did it, and what they found is that for every additional outlet in a census tract, you would get a 3% increase in violent crime for an on-premise outlet and a nearly 5% increase in crime for an off-premise outlet. 
Yes, for every additional outlet in a census tract, you got 3% more violent crime if it were a bar or restaurant and a nearly 5% increase in violent crime. This is over in the next year. If it were an off-premise outlet like a liquor store. That's not the only thing. We can also influence the practices in those stores. And one of the most powerful things we can do is influence the opening and closing hours. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But also shelf space, single serves. Uh, and then we have a whole set of studies, a couple of studies that we did. The influence of the advertising that's visible from their windows. And I'll come back to that when I talk about advertising. This is also a major equity issue. This is the city of Oakland, and those colors line up with redlining. You know what redlining was? It was a practice by the banks encouraged by the U.S. federal government in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. They identified the neighborhoods by color. Red, do not invest. Yellow, warning, warning, warning. Caution against investing. Blue, probably okay. Green, the best. Guess where all the alcohol outs are? They're in the red and yellow. These are the poor and more likely to be minority neighborhoods across our country. There is a historical, structural, racist reason for why the outlets are crowded in those communities. And it's not fair and it's not right. So there are things cities can do. You don't have licensing authority, but California was where we figured out how to do all the stuff you can do around planning and zoning, conditional use permits, deemed approved, all these technologies that we developed here that we're now spreading across the country, as well as nuisance powers, the basic power that cities in virtually every state has to regulate nuisances uh, in their jurisdiction. Is this effective? We have two studies. Most of our studies are looking at what happens when things go the other way. When you have more outlets, how much more do you have? More crime, more, more sexually transmitted infections, et cetera. There are two studies that have looked at what we call natural experience that, experiments that push back in the other direction. One was in Atlanta. It was a relatively wealthy neighborhood, and CDC did the evaluation. A 3% reduction in the number of alcohol outlets in that Buckhead neighborhood resulted in twice as high a reduction in violent crime in that neighborhood than in comparable neighborhoods elsewhere in the city. This is at a time when crime was going down generally. Again, Buckhead, twice as fast a decline. And this is a study we just published two weeks ago in uh, JAMA Internal Medicine. Baltimore, across the city, you can buy alcohol from 6 a.m. to 2 a.m., seven days a week. And there was one neighborhood in particular that was having a lot of violence, a lot of homicide, et cetera. The state rep from that neighborhood convinced the legislature to change the opening hours for just that neighborhood pulling them back to 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. We evaluated it. It's called an interrupted time series. You look at before, you look at after. We had control neighborhoods carefully chosen so that they were comparable on all sorts of axes. What we found is in the neighborhood where the hours were rolled back, there was an immediate 51% drop in homicide. And over the course of the next year, a 40% drop in homicides, and a 23% drop in violent crime overall. So simple and so effective. All right. The third A is attractiveness. And here you've got to understand alcoholic beverages are of their essence in this area of our lives, marketed beverages. And I can tell this partly by what I call the scream test. You kind of know you're on the right track, pushing back against the industry by how loudly the industry screams. And I've worked on all these things. They have never screamed as loudly as when I worked on the advertising. They are dependent on it. It functions as what economists call a significant barrier to entry to smaller firms. This is a highly concentrated, concentrated industry. If the top 10 alcohol companies worldwide were a country, they would be the 23rd largest economy in the world. Okay. Huge companies, big money, very concentrated. And the bigger the company, 
the lower their cost per drink, per barrel, whatever, of advertising is. So Anheuser-Busch, InBev, the largest beer company in the world, it's so much cheaper for them to advertise than everybody else because they're selling so much more per unit sold. And that keeps others out. It helps to generate what economists call oligopoly profits, which in turn support more marketing spend, which they use to encounter counter the increasingly bad health news. So how big are they? Anheuser Busch InBev is the 14th largest marketer in the world. They spent $6.7 billion on measured spending uh, in 2022. Uh more than globally, more than McDonald's, Coca-Cola, or Toyota. Diageo, 29th largest. Others among the top 100, Beam Suntory, Heineken, Pernod Ricard. Now, how many of you have ever heard of Pernod Ricard? How many of you ever heard of Diageo? This is part of how it works. You don't know the company behind the brands. How many of you have ever heard of Johnny Walker? Smirnoff. That's Diageo, okay? But you don't know that because they have this wonderful name. And Diageo, it means all over the world every day. And what does the marketing look like? These are some old ones. They're from Facebook. But, you know, this is Fireball Whiskey, one of my least favorite products. I'm still hungover from last night, and the only cure is more Fireball. For a loco, if this isn't you after Thanksgiving, you're doing it wrong. The main way this is governed is the alcohol industry self-regulatory code. I like to say this is not only the fox minding the chicken group, this is the fox building the chicken coop. But it, the code says things like uh, marketing materials shouldn't primarily appeal to individuals below the legal purchase age, but apparently it's okay to quote Dr. Seuss with a message that clearly appeals to peer pressure issues. What's the effect of all this? And those are just some examples. I have colleagues. We've done the studies. We have so many studies that industry self-regulation is completely ineffective. What's the effect? We have multiple systematic reviews at this point. The bottom line is the more young people are exposed to the marketing, the more likely they are to drink. And if already drinking, the more likely they are to drink more. Sometimes I like to ironically decorate my slides with industry ads. So this is the industry's version of a responsibility ad. This is why we don't think the industry belongs in prevention. The latest comprehensive review of this literature used the criteria that we have in epidemiology for deciding, deciding the relationship has moved from correlation to causality. They applied those criteria and concluded, yes, exposure to alcohol marketing plays a causal role in convincing young people to drink or to drink even more. What can states do about this? A lot of this is at the federal level or it's protected by uh, our Supreme Court uh, protections for commercial speech, but there are specific things that states can do. We did a report years ago, eight possible things uh, that states can do, and California gets an incomplete in two of the eight. I like to say there's a lot of potential here. And this is very much unexplored uh, in alcohol. The counter ads in tobacco were are so effective. You're in California. You've had the benefit of them for decades. There's so little happening here in terms of alcohol. This was a no-budget, really cheap campaign that we did with high school students in Baltimore with the help of the Maryland Institute College of Art. So we paired them with, you know, the commercial art folks. Uh, and this is what the kids came up with. Their own brand, Barf Beer, stands for Beer and Alcohol Ruin Futures. And they, this is the Colt 45 tagline and typeface and all this works every time. And they just paired it with things like a woman throwing up into a toilet or a body bag. Kids, they're so creative. What other evidence do we have of effects? There are very few natural experiments because, again, the trend in marketing has all been more, 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 not less, less, less. But we have a couple of studies that have looked at the impact of the retail signage, and one was done in San Jose, and they had mapped all the outlets. They knew what the alcohol outlet's influence was on violence, census block by census block. 
but somebody else mapped all the retail signage, all the signs you could see from the street. Even when they controlled for the concentration of the outlets, the sub signage visible from the street was significantly associated with increased sexual violence among Latinas and non-Latina 10 to 18 year olds in those neighborhoods. We did a similar study in Baltimore, and this one we published in the peer-reviewed literature, et cetera. <clears throat> what we found is, again, the more alcohol ads you could see from the street in a neighborhood, uh, the greater the amount of violent crime, even after we controlled for the alcohol outlets. Those are the three A's. This is back to the World Health Organization. And the World Health Organization has a package that they promote around preventing alcohol problems called the SAFER package. The SAFER package mixes the three best buys with what they call two good buys, which is facilitating access to screening, brief intervention, and treatment, and advancing and enforcing drink driving countermeasures. That's great. I encourage you to think SAFER and encourage you to remember this is the cost-effectiveness analysis for each of those interventions. And treatment is the ethical responsibility of a society that makes addictive products like alcohol widely available. We have to provide treatment, and we will never treat our way out of the problem. We just won't. It's incredibly expensive. A lot of the people calling the, causing the problem will never show up in treatment. They won't qualify for a dependence diagnosis. They drink occasionally, crash their car, and have caused a problem. And treatment is expensive. Drink driving is even more expensive. The cheapest one is taxes. Next cheapest is the ad bans. And after that, uh, strengthening restrictions on alcohol availability. If it's also clear, it's not rocket science. Why aren't we doing it? Hello. The industry does something that we like to call stakeholder marketing. So in the last election, in the 2020 election cycle, $23 million in federal level candidate contributions to federal level candidates and parties. They have 303 lobbyists working for them in DC. That is more than one lobbyist for every two members of Congress, what I call a very good teacher to student ratio. Last 20 years, they spent $51 million contributing money to your state legislature. It's well bought. So again, here's that health impact pyramid. Here's the stuff that's most effective. And in order to make it happen, we need to know how to build political will. So in California, how does your alcohol policy score do? Well, you're 47th out of the 50 states. You're not doing so good. And looking across 2000, 1999 to 2018, you are among the states with the least improvement in your alcohol policies. And the pandemic era policy changes have made things worse. With home delivery, with parklets that have expanded the square footage that outlets can serve and sell alcohol in, these things, it's a no-brainer. They're going to make the problem worse, and the data show they are, despite all of your best efforts. So how do we fight back? The data that uh, Craig presented, it was great. You need more data like that, and you need data that points to the environmental variables, things that San Diego pioneered in, like where are the kids getting the alcohol, like place of last drink, um, like how many ads do kids see on their way to school, um, you know, really basic stuff. Public opinion polling is really helpful. When we poll this stuff over and over again, we find the public is broadly in support of the policy measures. Why is that? Because most people don't drink very much. These policies don't affect them. They affect the people who cause the bulk of the problem, which is that 20% of the drinkers who are drinking 88% of the alcohol. Build broad-based coalitions, and we have to do this. Alcohol is the great cofactor. And it's often unrecognized, and I'm trying to build one of these coalitions in Massachusetts right now, and I'm really, really pleased. My la latest win is I got Local 7 of the Iron Workers Union to join my coalition. 
that's so great. You know, and uh, I love it. The president of the iron workers, he said to me, you know, I can imagine when you go to the legislature and you, you argue for this stuff, you must get beat up pretty bad. But, you know, I'm going to go in there with a bunch of my guys. They won't beat me up. <laughs> <laughs> Vinny DeMarco is the guy who has pioneered a lot of the organizing that we did in Maryland. And he likes to use the media shamelessly. It is a megaphone. Uh, and um, he's really good at it. Uh, and then he likes to make these an election year, year issue. Uh, and that extends over to lobbying. You cannot do that with county money, state money, federal money, etc. And if you're going to do anything like that, get a good lawyer. But the point here is build coalitions, use the news media. This is another analysis of public health policy change campaigns done by, by a colleague of mine at New York University. And he did this. He studied 12 different campaigns. And this is what he saw had in common. They combined organizing, legislation, litigation, and media advocacy that addresses corporate practices, that talks to the government, that talks to media, that leads to policy change, which then leads to changes in norms, behavior, and health. What are the opportunities in California? You've got so much power through all the work we did in the 80s, 90s. We know how to do this. We know how to give the tools to communities. But we gave them to communities, and everybody turned over, and they've forgotten they have them. I'm in Massachusetts now. We have more power over local outlets than you ever had, and my coalitions have no idea they have it. So one of the things I'm doing with support from our state is I'm developing a guide for our coalitions, and we'll do a series of trainings to remind them of the tools that they already have. And then the other thing you can do, it's so simple, change the closing hours. Really, really basic. On attractiveness, you have this wonderful thing called the Lee Law in California where no business of any kind can cover more than a third of its windows with signage. And uh, it's got a local option. So my town that I lived in when I lived here was Vallejo, and we tightened it to 15%, which the state law allowed us to do, cleaned up segments of Vallejo virtually overnight. Again, really concrete. And Friday Night Live has a really cool youth-led version of that, uh, yeah, that, that people can do. And then affordability, well, California last raised the alcohol tax in 1991. We had that big ballot campaign. We were going for a nickel a drink, and the industry, in order to confuse the voters, put penny a drink on the ballot themselves. Both of them lost. All revenue-raising things lost at the ballot that year. It was a recession year. Nobody wanted to pay more for anything. So the legislature came back after that and said, if the industry is willing to put a penny on drink on uh, the ballot, we will double the wine tax in California from one cent a gallon to two cents a gallon. Whoa. So... That was the last increase. Since then, those taxes have lost 55% of their value. I've told you a very different story about alcohol today. And I want to close by empowering you to tell that story and remind you of what we're up against. Because today it's the alcohol marketers who are telling the majority of the alcohol stories. And this is key to their larger role in social justice. They're telling a story that is imbued with sexism, racism, cultural appropriation, lies about the effects, and blaming the victim. Just very quickly, sexism. She's on her knees adjusting her lipstick using her boyfriend's belt buckle as a mirror. Use your imagination. She's only dripped in whipped cream. This is a product the world definitely needed, whipped cream vodka. Uh, and the tagline has been whipped lately. This is supposedly advertising drinking driving. What's the really advertising? Go home with me tonight. And by the way, you'll never look at alcohol ads again. Over and over in the ads targeting men, the woman is dressed like the product. She is in the Budweiser colors. That is no coincidence. They cause cancer, but they're going to be part of solution. They're going to donate a few pennies to cancer research. This was in women's magazines. Doesn't he look wonderful? 
cuddly, warm, etc. This was in the men's magazines. A hundred thousand, hundreds of thousands of women pre-programmed for your convenience. As you read this, women across America are reading something very different, an advertisement, figure one, scientifically formulated to enhance their perception of men who drink Molson. Racism. This is what they did in the 50s. They can't do that anymore. This is what they did in the 80s using tropes like civilized in the marketing towards the black community. This is more recent. Over and over again, the man has got more than one woman uh, in the ads targeting the black community. And colorism. He's darker. They're lighter skinned. These are not coincidences. And then this is a recent one. The tagline is nothing real heavy, not even the conversation, with the implication being you can't get a mixed race group of guys together to have a conversation that's not heavy unless you have whiskey. And then the Native American stuff. I mean, stealing the histories, the historic leaders of the Native American community, community putting their names on alcohol bottles. Uh, this one got through. This one so upset indigenous activists, they protested and the federal government uh, had it pulled off the market. But it brings us into cultural appropriation. The industry is shameless here with the Latinx community. Cinco de Mayo was created by the Chicano community as an opportunity for Chicano pride, and the industry turned it into a drinking holiday. Drink like a patron, hashtags tipsy for Cinco, uh, and so on. Lying about the effects, just a couple of examples. We published much more about this, but fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. Many feel there's insufficient evidence regarding moderate consumption of alcohol during pregnancy and the effect it may have on the developing fetus. Please. And then blaming the victim. It's a mistake to blame the product for alcohol abuse. Individual drinkers are responsible for their behavior. Works well for the industry. So in closing... I want to quote James Baldwin, not everything that's faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. We have to face what's actually going on around us, which is we have allowed this industry to dictate the terms to us about the role that alcohol will play in our lives. They are the dominant storyteller, and we have to tell a different story. Our stories matter. We can tell a new and better story of children growing up free from pressures to drink, of black, indigenous, and people of color and women being respected, of individual drinkers not being blamed for the actions of a hugely profitable industry, of poor communities and communities of color not being flooded with alcohol outlets and associated violence, and of alcohol prices that reflect the real cost of alcohol and don't just function to make a rich industry richer. Our voices matter. This is us. We can win. We are many. We are powerful. Our stories are powerful. We can act as one. Change begins with us. Thank you so much. Thank you.